Dzień dobry. Good morning. Hope you're all feeling well. First thing Sunday morning. My name is Michael Dexter, and I have taken it upon myself to document the Beehive Hypervisor. And I will give some background. And my goal today is to whet your appetite, as they say, and to make it easy for you to give it a try. And hopefully begin developing on it. So, a little background on Beehive. Who's familiar with an unconference? Okay, Fred. So, an unconference is a novel idea where you congregate, you typically put up a giant board and have stick on messages, and you propose topics. You announce your topic in front of the group, put it up, and through a combination of voting and rearranging and horse trading, you come up with a schedule. You, few people have prepared slides, and it's a remarkably effective tool for getting an up-to-date topic discussed. So, Meet BSD California took place in 2010 and will take place next month. It's an unconference format with a few prepared sessions. And you congregate, you propose, you break out into sessions, and if you're lucky, you repeat the next day. So, you're doing it wrong. Somehow, at Meet BSD 2010, everyone wanted to attend the virtualization session. I had never seen that. Everyone got in a room, <laughs> every breakout room was empty, and we discussed virtualization. So, 100% attendance. They're like the vendor summit meeting, there was a small intimate discussion the next day after everyone had time to think about it, what they <coughs> discussed, and the conclusion was we need a hypervisor. And as always, we have no idea who will pursue that. <clears throat> so the result, at BSD CAN 2011, Neil Natu and Peter Grian at the Dev Summit announced Beehive to a rather stunned audience. And you can find their slides on the FreeBSD wiki, and there is an audio recording of that and maybe a video. I suggest you check them out. And a history of my involvement, about six months after BSD CAN, I said, hey, that's pretty cool. What's going on? And they have day jobs. And they said, well, it's out there. And yes, we can help you get, it, get going. So at my little journal, I put up an article on Beehive demonstrating everything I've learned to date and how to build it. And in April, I set up beehive.org simply as a repository. And I should have a special thanks to the New York City BSD users group who has some storage space for some prepared guest images because throwing around 60 to 400 megabyte images is not something for everyone's server. There was, an, there was a Google Summer of Code project this summer that is not completed because a developer ran into an issue towards the end. Hopefully that will complete. And it is a project to include a BIOS for supporting foreign operating systems. So. If you're not familiar with the convention, too long didn't read. For those of you who want to run, it requires Intel extended page tables. Guests are booted from disk images, unlike jails, which are typically from a file system. Uh, JHB, uh, John Baldwin recently made some changes to the assembler in Tree that allows for the existing GPLv2 license assembler to include the new instruction sets. The bin utils package is GPLv3, and that concerns a number of people. It's close to being ready to being dropped into head, but not yet. And there's a bit of a chicken and egg issue. So I want your involvement to hopefully push that over the top. It can be dropped into 9.0 quite reliably, and I'll show you that. And it's easiest to test on FreeBSD 9 and 10 current. There were patches 15 hours ago the last time I checked. So the fire has been lit under them, and the developers. And it began life at FreeBSD 8.1. So guests are generally possible with some workarounds from 7.2 forward, which might be quite attractive to those with, say, embedded products and who want to contain them on newer host operating systems. It should build with Clang quite easily. And I haven't tried this, but for those with Macs, Reportedly, VMware Fusion on the Macintosh has VTX and perhaps VTD pass-through. 
such that you can run this in virtualization on hardware that supports it. If you do it in VirtualBox, you'll find that it says it's a pre-generic PC without extended page tables. That's a cool trick. So in context, and we touched on this briefly before the talk, the d proprietary and dominant player is VMware. Quite a few hands came up for those using that. It contains BusyBox, and I challenge any user to get sources from the vendor and build BusyBox and put it into your, to your VMware instance as per the terms of the GPL. They may be violating it, and that could be a mess. Linux has the KVM hypervisor, which is the closest, uh, uh, closest work alike, closest design to Beehive. They also have LXC containers, which were inspired by FreeBSD jails. They have a few interesting features and are missing a few features, so it's sort of the Linux jail. Smart OS, a, a derivative of Illumos, formerly OpenSolaris, has the Linux KVM hypervisor that they imported. They have zones, which were clearly inspired by FreeBSD jails. They've added new features, new features, and they actually run their hypervisor in a in a zone such that if you break out of it, you're, you're stuck in a zone. FreeBSD has made the most progress as a, as a guest on, say, Amazon EC2, and there are, there's various Zen work going on, but I'm not clear if the FreeBSD Zen host is fully up to speed, and nor should you want that. And honorable mention at BSD Zen, the classic open source hypervisor, it is large, it is reliable, but uh, you can see my multiplicity talk for a little more about that. So in context, what is this hypervisor thing? Quite some time ago, I was a year old, um, Popek and Goldberg defined a hypervisor back on, Intel, on IBM mainframe hardware, where they were uh, in hardware accommodating previous generations of the system. So they defined the formal requirements for a hypervisor and uh, the, the qualities you look for, the properties you look for. Now, uh, it doesn't help to get too caught up in the t different types of hypervisor. Type 1 is a dedicated kernel and user land, which is generally off the shelf part, such as VMware, and it launches, then come your guests. A Type 2 is something that is built under some form of host operating system. One can argue that the, the uh, intricacies are hidden in the host operating system, but FreeBSD is rather proven. As Alistair Crooks pointed out yesterday, more data has gone through FreeBSD thanks to Netflix than any other OS, so I wouldn't get too concerned about the risks of type two hypervisors. The properties of a good hypervisor are equivalence fidelity. Basically, it should look like the host system it's running on, and that raises the question of does the guest need to be modified in any way or can it simply be installed from an, uh, an ISO image and booted as if it's in a nice, friendly, familiar system. Uh, resource control, is the hypervisor indeed control of the guest or is there a risk of it running free and monopolizing resources? And efficiency, primarily compared to say a software emulator where there's a significant significant performance drop. A hypervisor should be near native performance because you are using hardware extensions to get as close as you can to a pro proper experience. And the Wikipedia pages are pretty good. Not great, but good. So hardware assisted virtualization. This is in the words of Peter yesterday. Beehive is all built on VTX exits. They are used to build the PCI emulation since IO instructions are used for PCI config space. Um, you may read that the biggest breakthrough was the extended page tables that were introduced with Nehalem hardware from Intel and is, that's basically core i5 first generation forward, I'll touch on that, and newer systems. But uh, EPT was a breakthrough and as I've joked before, let's party like it's 1980 because we finally have a PC with some tiny mainframe features. So hardware assisted, assisted virtualization. Uh, the v, you've probably heard the buzzword VTX, VTD, and others and seen it show up in your D message. So 
Systems have had VTX for quite some time, since I think even Pentium 4 systems. That intercepts privileged instructions and routes them and things such as um, uh, page misses and all were handled in software. Recently, Intel added uh, virtualization for directed I.O. so that hardware devices can be um, masked out from the host system and provided to a hypervisor. And the extended page tables replace a large amount of MMU software emulation in hardware. And that is a major performance improvement uh, source. And I believe like many of these technologies, like AMD 64, AMD pioneered these. And they're out there. And Beehive can support them in theory, but it's a matter of just a few developer hours. So if you have a system, you can try this here. You've probably seen the VMX little uh, feature for quite some time. Uh, the one to look for is pop count. That is not the best choice of a phrase. It could be mispronounced. And traditionally, and I believe in all cases, pop count includes EPT in any of the similar generation processors. Quite recently, Intel has kindly added uh, EPT compatibility on their site, and I'll get to that. So Nehalem, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge systems, most core systems that start with an I, um, but they've complicated it by adding Celeron and Pentium systems, which is uh, a surprise. So I3, I5, I7 processors, most of the Xeon processors from that generation, perhaps all, although there are Xeons back to 386s, so the term Xeon is useless in this context. Surprisingly, let's see, Pentium Mobile and Celeron processors, and VTD is available on generally higher-end processors, so I'll show you how to find that out. Some vendors will have a BIOS option to enable or disable the VTX features. Why, I don't know, because I don't know what harm they would do, and potentially a vendor might block them out entirely from your system, even though it's on the CPU. As for why towards Blue Pill. Blue Pill? Fair enough. So, arc.intel.com is your friend. Uh, core processors get all the attention, and I was surprised to find a Pentium processor with extended page tables and BTX. So, for about the last year, at the very bottom of those processor descriptions, they've included EPT. There is absolutely no graphic matrix with all the processor names, the wattages, the EPT, and the price. That would be too convenient. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so the assembler implications, I've touched on this earlier. So, I don't want to recap too much, but uh, FreeBSD has had a somewhat older binutils assembler because it was GPLv2 licensed. You could add the GPLv3 version's newer one that includes support for the EPT instructions, but that would never make it into base, key point. So for quite some time, one would just drop that in, which seemed to be version 22.2 underscore 3, but John Baldwin implemented the missing instructions. Everyone thought it would be way too hard and take forever, but no, we just did it. And if you look at the FreeBSD revisions 238123 and 238167, you will see those changes. And those changes can be dumped on a, a nine system. You can build uh, bin utils and it works just fine. So here's a brief description of what he changed. It's just those instructions for those who care. So uh, here is how I pulled those in. You'll find that in the different revisions, some were updated later, so you don't have to pull all of them twice. I just pulled out these five of them, and it worked. Uh, hop in there and build it, and you have a working assembler. This makes life much easier. So the versioning moving target. 
we have begun life with FreeBSD 8.1. And so I've found FreeBSD 9 to be a great point of reference, although I started my work before even the release was out. So it's, it's very good to have a fixed point of reference to which one can say it works or doesn't work. So since 9, there have been a number of floating point changes, and Beehive is slowly catching up, and of course that's all in head. So FreeBSD 10 is the way to go, but they have not yet set up a build system, and they would like to have ISOs built, and he mentioned hosting them maybe at all BSD. And my first logical thought was, okay, I will build the current one, make a release, and try it and spending about half a day doing that each one and then having it blow up on me and I knew there had to be a more efficient way to <laughs> test for regression. So my solution, start with 9.0 release. And fortunately, uh, PCBSD 9.0 is FreeBSD 9.0 and it's fully compatible. You can work with them and do presentations and, <laughs> and hypervisor at the same time, <laughs> demos. Um, the build environment. Beehive is tiny, and building world for, as you'll see, a very small amount of components is a waste of time and resources and SSD ticks. So I came up with a way to, one, not touch the included release source directory with the help of all, UnionFS mount it to a similar one, which is source Beehive, drop from SVN the changes, which are not very large, and on an SSD system, put a memory device for object, so I'm just blasting the results into RAM. And if you unmount that uh, UnionFS, you get to see essentially a diff, albeit binary, of what was changed. Very cool. So here are the components of Beehive. There is a... Uh, just three user-facing utilities. User, actually, I think that's, mm, yes, in SBIN, Beehive, Beehive Load, and VMM CTL. I've given the link of the sources in source, what directory they're in. There is a library that's used, which is in user source library lib VMM API, which has a number of components, and they're, the blue ones are visible. You'll see them in your file system. They're not like built into the kernel. And the red ones are actual utilities that you can call, but you, in fact, will only call Beehive, which you include with Beehive load and VMM CTL, and it's pretty, pretty elegant. And the module is the vmm.ko kernel. So currently, guests must be modified just a little bit. It's running FreeBSD on FreeBSD, so it's, it's not monumental. Um, it's important to have MP table, even back well, for each of the versions, that in time will change. Um, there is the uh, BVM console, which simply means it starts booting and jumps into your, your own console, and it's just, a, as they put it, brain dead simple console. Uh, the X2 APIC support, which is for performance, so it may be optional, but you want it. Uh, MP mockedup and the kernel configuration file, which simply has the console and MP table. And when they get ACPI working, that will go away. Not a whole lot of changes, and anyone who's built FreeBSD can figure these out. So helping the guests are vert.io, and there are a number of vert.io projects out there. This is the one from Brian Uventeker. I'll guess, Germans in the audience, <laughs> help me there. Um, not too out of Japan. And there is the uh, TAP network device, which allows a guest to have networking. And you build a guest without uh, modules because it, it will not be looking at hardware. It's simply in a little contained environment. So this is the file layout. You've, who's built a jail in the past? That's basically a user land. Here is a user land in a disk image, which can either be disk dev or MD root for memory backed image. The kernel is external to the guest file system, a bit like Zen, where you point it at a kernel and say, go to town. 
the vert I.O. modules are outside of that environment, and the, the boot directory is pretty much off the shelf. I copy it from the host, and it works. And user boot SO, required by the utilities. Um, and the red is a heavy lifting where you must build the kernel and prepare your disk image. But, and you can use whatever tricks you like, be it either nano BSD or otherwise, to build that user land. It's simply a free BSD user land. So host preparation. Um, currently, one must deduct memory from the host to allow it to be used by guests. And one does that with the HW FISMEM uh, property. There's to take, say, a, an 8 gig or 16 gig system down to 4 gigs to the host operating system and allow the rest to be available to guests. Um, currently, Beehive's a bit noisy, so there's the, you might want to suppress some debug output. And the last ones can be done from the command line, such as load the VMM kernel and set up your networking. Pretty straightforward. So this is what my system puts out if I've done the entry, real memory, and available memory. It, I'm now down to 4 gigs out of 16. And I'm amazed how affordable memory is right now. Just let the record show. <laughs> so from the beginning, Neil has had a very simple downloadable guest image. It has a few shortcomings in my opinion. It is MD uh, root backed, meaning it's a memory file system, meaning any changes you make vanish upon reboot. And it's at like 105% capacity. So you can't really drop anything exciting in there and test that. And for what it's worth to accommodate a, using a large MD root, there's a kernel option you probably want to set so that the system is fine with that. So here is the boot string. And Neil has kindly provided a captive script that simplifies this. But I, for development purposes, I want it as verbose as possible. You can see the user land utilities, VMMCTL, Beehive Load, and Beehive that are simply available in SBIN. Um, variables such as the name of your guest and memory allocation, I believe above and below the i386 classic memory map. Uh, using vert.io, the networking interfaces, and I found that I needed to sleep IF config, wait till the system boots, then launch it so you can have networking. And We'll get to this later, but it boots like a FreeBSD system. It is FreeBSD on FreeBSD, and that's just a, a capture from my console. So shutdown, you can shut down or reboot. If you do reboot, it'll give you the splash screen, hit escape, type quit, and it'll drop back into your host, host console. And I mentioned not wanting to build world all afternoon and did it through Thanksgiving and <laughs> family didn't like that. So to build these components a la carte, I had to do a few tricks. One is dropping in from SVN the modified components for Beehive on top, of, on top of a source tree. And again, that I did with the Union FS mount. I had to do a few make file changes just so that they could build in situs as opposed to in the full build world. And several of the utilities needed machine linked in there, so it, it knows where the heck it is. So building the guest image, again, use your preferred jail building technique. I simply uh, made a disk image 400 megabytes in size, uh, mounted it through MD config, labeled it, mounted it on mount, and over the wire, fetched the release and just dropped it on top. Um, you could probably do the same with the PCBSD basic release, but it's probably a lot larger. It did take time to get the FS tab right, rc.conf if you have want networking, resolve.conf, and TTYs. Because you're going to a console and a console, it's not complex, but it needs to be done. And I've scripted everything to do that. And you might want to enable SSH login for further testing, although you do see the booted console into your console. Now, how you get there, I've had Beehive Menu SH out there for quite some time. Hopefully, by the end of the day, I'll update the rest of these. I've done it a la carte so you can see exactly what's happening. I want to be very verbose about this so there's no magic to worry about. Uh, 
prepare the sources like the Union FS mount, uh, patch the assembler, build the assembler, copy it in, and patch the loader for the memory uh, reduction. So <laughs> this was a quotation from a little while ago. Theodore was a bit concerned that x86 virtualization is about basically placing another nearly full kernel full of new bugs on top of a nasty x86 arch architecture, uh, which barely has correct page protection. Then running your operating system on the other side of this brand new pile of stuff. Uh, you are absolutely deluded, if not stupid, if you think that a worldwide collection of software engineers who can't write operating systems or applications without security holes can then turn around and suddenly write virtualization layers without security holes. Theodorat. So, the heavy lifting of Beehive is vmx.c, which does all the bit banging for the extended page tables and VTX functions. I downloaded it, I sorted it, dumped the comments, dumped the spaces, and 1,300 lines of code. That's small. And in my process, I build a simple package of the user land utilities, the, the kernel module and all that, and thought, wait, I should check this, and it's 259K. A hypervisor in far less than a meg. So again, who's run VMware, who's run Zen, who's <laughs> run all the alternatives? That you can keep in your head. <laughs> this is good. The future. So I got some comments from Peter last night, planning APIC tables. I'm not a developer. Some of this is simply internal features. And of course, through the course of this, Intel is releasing new features. So, and FreeBSD simultaneously. So Beehive has to catch up with the two of them. But uh, generally, the result is very good. Um, I think just yesterday, Neil contributed the either first part of or all of guest idle detection. Currently, a guest will monopolize the CPU at 100%. That will drop down to nothing if the guest is doing nothing. HCI device simulation, VertIO MSI support. If, you, if you're familiar with those, that will make sense. I sure hope Takuya will complete his work. Let's work on him. It's exciting stuff. He, he took on a hard challenge, bless his heart. <laughs> I cornered him in a bar in Tokyo and said, hey, can you port this to OpenBSD? And instead he's doing BIOS, which is, would be a killer app to have, say, Windows or Linux booting natively on Beehive. So good props his way. Uh, more, emul more internal goodies and AMD support, which is straightforward of using nested page tables instead of extended page tables. Or RVI, as they've renamed it, and all these technologies get renamed by the marketing department every few months. Um, on the horizon, um, better integration with the host scheduler, memory overcommit, such that you can convince a guest that it has a gigabyte of memory and really only use what's what's uh, being used, like a like a sparse disk image. And in, on that note sparse disk images, and I haven't tried this, but it should work with Zvols right now. Very cool. Um, Vert IO has been developed in parallel, and the developer is not a, key, a core committer, so it's been a bit of a game getting it into FreeBSD and then further into Beehive. And uh, oh, generalization of the CPU IDs. If you say boot a, a guest on your little core i5 and want to move it to your Xeon down at the data center. If some of the CPU ID issues are uh, generalized, anonymized, whatever, the guest will not care that it's on a different CPU. Currently, it will say, oh my gosh, what happened? <laughs> what have you done to me? My to-do list, um, PCI pass-through. It's a bit frustrating that not all hardware has the VTD extension, so when you're shopping for a notebook or something, look pretty carefully if, at arc.intel.com if it has the, the VTD extensions. There's the syntax. You find out what the device is. You use the black hole driver to mask it from the host operating system. So the physical card is there. The OS ignores it. I think. We'll get to the proper term. It'll, it probes it, says, OK, let's not talk to you. Move on. And then when you're launching the Beehive guest, you 
add the dash F option and tell it what card or device, what PCI device to go after. Also, you can redirect to a serial console for what it's worth. And somewhat excitingly, Nano Beehive. So I'm impressed with FreeNAS and 259K, adding a hypervisor to that is quite simple. And for all those who have their like um, VMware served by an iSCSI machine could have the hypervisor on that little flashcard. I'm excited. And uh, I don't know who saw the uh, Chris Moore's Warden talk yesterday. It should be quite simple to in include uh, Beehive support. Instead of a FreeBSD jail, instead of a Linux jail, have a Beehive jail. Uh, that's in the works. And mmm, dog food. I actually did this running PCBSD on my little uh, refurbished ThinkPad and used LibreOffice. It was a bit painful at times, but I'm happy to do that. And I'll do a little live demo. Any questions here and now? Impossible. <laughs> yes? What is missing uh, to be able to put other operating systems on the Just as BIOS work? That's the, the heart of it. And there have been, oh, there was a past project years ago that was a simple BIOS for another purpose, and that might be usable. Um, you've probably seen that uh, I think it's Zen and even KVM use a lot of the QEMU components. They have a more compatible licensing and they're probably big bloated components, but that's the heart of it. Um, con adapting another BSD to boot shouldn't be too difficult. It's mostly just loader issues and um, it's, it's far more familiar than, say, Windows. Um, I hope that answers your question. Other questions? So, what does it take to make the project a letter? More people interested? More people interested. Uh, Neil and Peter have day jobs, and they you know, blast out what they can. But again, it's a bit of a chicken and egg issue. If there are three of us using it, um, having that you know, tiny user group is a bit uh, limiting. So uh, do get out there. There's there are countless opportunities to improve it from packaging. I, I just throw things in old tarball in the directories and it's definitely not a correct FreeBSD package, but it works. So uh, vendors, look at the code. It's, it's not big. Um, test it, see what hardware it works on, breaks on. I haven't had incompatibility issues. Um, do check out my site, callfortesting.org and beehive.org. I, again, describe where the utilities are, how they're built, what they do, and just familiarize yourself because, again, it's not a lot of code. Fair enough? Other questions? You will see that the host system it has access to about, well, the video, um, about yeah, almost uh, just over three gigabytes of memory out of 16. KLD stat, the above all the VMM kernel driver is running. And the disk dev is a 400 megabyte disk image that I've built with scripts. The boot directory is quite familiar. There's the host OS. There's uh, PCBSD has quite a few added components, but the Beehive guest boot is quite simple. Uh, there are the kernel, mostly uh, vert IO bits and the kernel. Uh, so, As I mentioned earlier, one can, one cannot reduce host memory on the fly. One has to reboot, but one can obviously load the kernel modules. So I have a very simple script, um, VM prep, that does that preparation. And, and as I described in that breakdown of the command, 
uh, VM run. Did I? Oh, sorry, suspense is probably killing it. That is Beehive. It's strictly FreeBSD on FreeBSD. Um, little funny treatment of the border there, no biggie. You'll see the vert IO drivers fly by. And uh, uh, what do you want? Top. It's running a standard base installation. I didn't try doing the networking through the wireless. So at the moment I cannot I cannot um, probably network. Let's see. You will see that it is consuming the processor, however the patches went in in this in hopefully the full solution, just literally within the last twenty four hours. So that should drop down to near zero percent. Um, Ta-da! <laughs> and do catch me in the hallway, etc., and I'll help set you up with it. Um, let's. We have just a moment, so let's see. Uh, uh, Midori Web Shortcuts Confirmer. Later and control L. Okay, at beehive.org you will find the images I've, I'm booting from right here. It's uh, the 400 megabyte image. Thank you, nice bug. And the 259K package. 65 on that build. Um, a link to the presentation. And I will get my, my a la carte scripts up there as soon as possible. There is a wiki entry page, but it's, it's hit or miss because the developers threw in a few of their napkin notes. And what I started with was literally their own notes themselves that were not ready for consumption on the outside. Um, my article on the subject and the mailing list is the best place to discuss it. There is no dedicated Beehive mailing list. Thank you.